what I want to do tonight is talk to you about some things in relation to, or what I would call practical instruction for perilous times. Uh, I'm going to start in Second Timothy chapter 3. <coughs> Most of you are probably familiar with the verse. Uh, but the verse, the passage starts out with Paul saying, This know also, in the last days, perilous times shall come. Now, I guess you would have to identify perilous, uh, but I believe that everybody, that has every saved person that has lived since the Apostle Paul, uh, <coughs> excuse me, got a, all of a sudden got a bug in my throat. Mary, if you're listening in there, how about bringing me some water? Uh, in in chapter 3, verse 1, he says, This is also in the last days perilous times shall come. And as I was saying, I would imagine that most everybody throughout Christianity since the days of the Apostle Paul have believed that they were living in perilous times. And uh, I think that is, is in some way true. Uh, because the things that Paul says are going to, that uh, are perilous, that identify these perilous times, we certainly can see have happened throughout history. Now, notice what he says there. He said, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Well, I would I would ask you the question, has there ever been a time when men weren't lovers of their own selves? Uh, the Bible indicates that we are lovers of our own selves, that we're all sinners with a sin nature. And then Paul goes on to say covetous. Uh, mankind has always been covetous. Uh, matter of fact, all the way back in the Ten Commandments, one of the first one of the uh, first two or three commandments is thou shalt not covet. And uh, then he says there, uh, men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. So I would ask you, when has there been a time when those things were not true? You see, I think the thing was written so that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, could write that without identifying a specific period of time. Uh, thank you, dear. My sweet wife has brought me some water. And, of course, it's in my favorite cup, Roll Tide. Uh, so there's always, th th these things are written in such a way that they could apply to any time because there's always perilous times. Now, Paul goes on to say, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and leave captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lust, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth, men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the truth. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Now I think maybe we get a little bit of a clue about uh, what Paul is really talking about here when he says these things are going to occur in the last times or in the last days. Uh, you see, I, I believe that it's very possible what Paul was talking about is that those who name Christ, those that perhaps are even members of the body of Christ, will take on the same traits and characteristics of those that never profess Christ. He says there are those who are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Paul said uh, that it is God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And there are some very specific instructions, particularly to Timothy, in First and Second Timothy that I want us to look at tonight that should help us in the last days to keep our focus 
on what we need to be doing and what is really important and what our attitude ought to be as we go forward. Now, if you turn back with me to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, In 1 Timothy 4, in verse 1, Paul says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now here again, there's another verse that would seem that, that what Paul is saying has happened many times over the years and continues to happen on a regular basis. Because there's always been those that would depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. But I think Paul specifically here is speaking about saved people. Why do I say that? Well, in order to depart from the faith, and by the way, if you want to get a concordance and or a computer program or a Bible program, and you want to run the references on the faith, what you'll find out is, is that when Paul uses that phrase, the faith, most of the time, it is in reference to uh, the body of doctrine that was presented to the Apostle Paul. We'll look at the verse as we close tonight. But in 2 Timothy 4, Paul said, I have kept the faith. Well, what did he keep? He kept that revelation given to him, the revelation, the mystery, the information for the church, the body of Christ. You see, what we find today is there's a lot of people that have in the past acknowledged the truth of Paul's epistles and the truth of Paul's distinctive ministry, and today they're going back on that. Today they're going back and saying that the church started before the Apostle Paul. Uh, they're even saying that, that Peter preached the same gospel as Paul. Well, those people are departing from the faith. And when I say, when it says giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, that doesn't mean that they're possessed with a devil in the sense of the exorcist or something like that where they need an exorcism. You see, any false doctrine is doctrine of the devil. Now, make no mistake about that. People might take their doctrine straight from the Word of God, but it is not, if it is not dispensationally presented and dispensationally considered, then it is the doctrine of the devil. And that's what Paul says. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving hoods of the and spirits and doctrines of devils. Notice what he says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. In other words, they have no conscience about teaching the things that they teach that are contrary to the Word of God. And I see that is very prevalent today among uh, Bible teachers and, and, and people that at one time held and embraced the truth of right division and yet no longer do so. Uh, then Paul lists some specific things that these in his day were doing. Uh, forbidding to marry. We know that would uh, uh, identify, we could identify with that the Catholic Church today that forbids priests to marry. Uh, commanding to abstain from meats. Seventh-day Adventists today and other religions abstain from eating meats. Uh, and he goes on to say, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. And in a very general sense, you can look at that verse and simply say that there are multitudes of people that base their ministry on teaching do's and don'ts. I've been accused of that myself. But listen, folks, it's not my business what you do or what you don't do. I, I present what the Word of God says, and if I want to, if I teach some time on things that Paul said in relation to the way we live, so be it. But it's not my position that my job is to show you what you ought to do or not do, whether you ought to drink or don't drink or uh, smoke or don't smoke or, or whatever. We live in an age when we have liberty to do whatsoever we wish. Now, all things are not expedient. All things edify not, but we certainly have that liberty. And it's ridiculous for me to try to impose do's and don'ts on anybody that's a member of the body of Christ. Uh, I'm not, I, I, I don't have that responsibility, and I thank God for it. Uh, I had two kids, and it was, I had to deal with them for, you know, 18 years of their life, but when they got grown, I don't have the right to tell them what to do or not to do. The point is in this is that Paul is basically saying, 
When there are those people, there are those people that when they depart from the faith, give heed to seducing spirits, they get involved in a ministry of do's and don'ts. And that's what he's talking about here. Notice what he says there in verse 4. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, that is, you don't have to abstain from meats. But you see, Paul is dealing with something very specific here, obviously. The Jewish people that Paul had ministered to had a tendency to want to remain under the ordinances and the law. And there were those that tried to impose those laws on other people. And they said, you shouldn't eat meat. You shouldn't, uh, uh, you shouldn't marry and that kind of thing. Well, Paul is, is, op- I mean, Paul is blatantly showing that's not true. He says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, verse 6, Thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in word, in the words of faith and of good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. You know, there's a man in our church, he's only been there uh, a short time, but he made an amazing statement to me the other day. Uh he said, you know, Steve, after being here for a while, I have realized that most of what is taught in religion today is simply superstition. And you know, that's true. Uh, there's so much superstition today about what God's doing and what God's not doing and how God is uh, uh, interacting with people today and all that kind of stuff. And that's exactly what Paul is talking about. He says, refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. And according to Titus chapter 1, godliness has to do with acknowledging of the truth. So Paul says uh, there's going to be in last days these problems. Now notice his instruction to Timothy in verse 16. He says in verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Now we know that Paul is writing to a saved man. And one thing for you to remember and always keep in mind is every time you see saved in the Bible, it's not talking about uh, eternal salvation from hell like we know we have in Christ Jesus. Paul has just described a whole list of events that are going to happen as a result of people falling away and as a result of apostasy. And Paul is telling Timothy, the only way you're going to save yourself from apostasy, and listen, every one of us, every one of you listening, including myself, the only way we can be sure that we are saved from apostasy, and apostasy simply means the falling away from the truth, the only way we can assure that is to do exactly what he said in verse 16. Take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So Paul is adamant that we are to focus on doctrine, the doctrine for the church and body of Christ. Now, go back over to 2 Timothy again, 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, uh, notice what Paul says there in verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Then he goes on to say, uh, Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto these, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Now, in those few words, there is a multitude of information that people ought to grasp on to, hold on to, and never let go of. The words that Paul said in the verse there, in verse 8, or verse 7, I'm sorry. The first four words, consider what I say. You see, the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John 
is not going to get you through the troubles and the perilous times that we face today. What the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will do is it will have you believing you've got to endure to the end to be saved when you already are saved. The doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will have you believing that you've got to keep the law. The doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will believe that will have you believing that your commission is to go in the world all the gospel and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them that believe. The, the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will have you selling out what you have, like they did in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Because Jesus said, take no thought for your life what you're going to eat or drink put on. The doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John will have you believing that whatsoever you ask in prayer, God will give to you. And we can go on and on and on, folks. The point is, the doctrine of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John cannot equip you for the perilous times that we're going to face in this present dispensation. You know what will equip you to face that? Consider what I say. Not what I say. Consider what Paul says. Paul is writing to Timothy and saying, Consider what I say. You see, those that teach that Peter and James and John and the Twelve are teaching the same thing Paul did, ignore the importance of this verse. Because Peter... All the way over in Second Peter, he makes it clear that they're still waiting on the coming of the Lord. They're, they're expecting his return. But it didn't happen. You see, we're looking for the catching away. And we need to consider what Paul says. And don't be ashamed of the Apostle Paul or his doctrine. Look back in chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy 1, look in verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You see, I believe there's a lot of people today that have become ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. And they've become ashamed to identify with the truth that Paul preached. I know no other reason why a person would depart from rightly dividing after having believed it for several years, when it is the most liberating truth in the world today. And yet there are people who depart from that doctrine. And there are people who uh, do not follow the doctrine given to the Apostle Paul. Uh, the the Paul is clear. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor his prisoner. Now notice what he says. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, according to the power of God. You see, there are some afflictions that come with standing for the testimony of our Lord. Preaching the gospel clear and simple and plain, without any works attached, without water baptism, without church membership, without denominational affiliation. All of those things people put stock in, and yet there is no value in it as far as salvation is concerned. Be not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Then there must be some. And certainly there are when we stand far and preach the truth of the gospel. We preach the cross of Christ. While well, back in Philippians, go back over to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says there in verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to do all things unto himself. You see, there are enemies of the cross of Christ. 
I believe there's some saved people that end up being enemies of the cross because they go back and teach things contrary to the finality and the the uh, all uh, all sufficient grace extended at the cross. So Paul says, take heed. He said, consider what I say. And he said, don't be ashamed. Now notice here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 13, he goes on to say there, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Hold fast the form of sound words. That's the doctrine. Paul, over and over to Timothy, and these are the last letters that Paul wrote. Second Timothy, last letter Paul wrote. And over and over again, he is emphasizing to hold fast to the form of sound words. Those words given to and through the Apostle Paul. Uh, and, and it's hard for people to do that. Uh, look back in Second Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2, in verse 1, Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong, be strong. But he doesn't stop there. Notice what he says. Therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Don't just be strong. You know, it's one thing to be dedicated to what you believe, but if you believe a lie... It's all in vain. It's all futile. Paul says be strong in the grace. Be strong in the doctrine of grace. Don't let anybody move you away from the truth of the grace of God. Don't let anybody put you under the bondage of a religious system. Don't let anybody try to put you back under the law or the kingdom doctrine. Be strong in the grace. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then look in 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. In 2 Timothy 2, he says, in verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Again, let me emphasize that Timothy had had encounters, no doubt, with the twelve. He had had encounters with Peter and James and John. And they didn't change their teaching to fit Paul's doctrine. I mean, that's what people want to uh, portray today, but their doctrine remained the same. I mean, go back and look at uh, a message we just preached uh, a while back on, on the, the doctrine of Hebrews through Revelation. I did a message out in Texas uh, showing how the doctrine of Hebrews through Revelation in no way could be the doctrine for the church and body of Christ. And yet there are people who embrace that doctrine and try to make it match Paul's epistles. Well, let me tell you something. It's just as wrong to try to make the doctrine of Hebrews through Revelation match Roman through Philemon as it is to try to make Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John match Romans through Philemon. They will not match. They are not the same doctrine. And that's why Paul says, The things that thou hast heard of me, not the things you heard of Peter, Timothy, not the things you heard from James or John or any of those other men. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see, every person listening to this broadcast, as you are taught, you ought to try to find an opportunity sometime, somewhere, to teach other people. And uh, there may not be multitudes of opportunities, but there are opportunities. Uh, there are two people. I see the name on the screen here tonight, and I think about this quite frequently. Uh, Brother Dave Zimmerman up in our Kentucky class and uh, Tony Dunning, both of them in our Kentucky class. And Dave was doing some work for Tony, and Tony made a, a statement, and uh, it was uh, he was it was somewhat biblical in nature, but it was it was a wrong statement. And Dave uh, corrected it and did so in a kind fashion and began to talk to Tony about what he believed. Uh, since that time, Tony's been part of our Bible study. He left the Baptist church, he and his wife Leslie, and there have been a great blessing to us, and it's a great blessing anytime people see the truth and come to understand. But you see, Dave could have been ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, 
and kept his mouth shut. But fortunately, Dave opened his mouth and made truth, the, the, the things that he knew, and shared them with somebody. And as a result, another person was established in the faith. You see, that's what the ministry is about, folks. You meet people every day that nobody else uh, listening to this message tonight are going to meet. And you, you might not feel like you have enough Bible knowledge to discuss things with people, but let me tell you something. The majority of religious people out there, if you know anything at all, you know about three times more than they do. Because people do not, and I'm not saying that in, in a harsh or mean way, the fact is people don't study their Bible. People go to church and they're entertained, and they listen to the music, and they listen to a preacher tell stories, and they're not taught the Bible. And you've got the Word of God. And you ought to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And you need to be faithful to teach others the things which you have learned, that they might rejoice in them also. Now let me go on to say this, and I, I want you to understand. There are probably ten times, well, more than that, I'm sure. But there are multitudes of people that Dave has tried to talk to. I've seen him on Facebook, and I know he's faithful in, in telling people about the Word, that have rejected what he said. But you see, that's the whole point in it. You never know when the next person you talk to might be the person that would either accept the gospel and be saved or accept the truth of right division and be freed from the religious bondage that they've been a part of all their life. So we have a responsibility. The preacher can't do it all. The preacher can't reach everybody. We do everything we can through radio and TV and Internet. But listen, you're going to come in contact with people I never will. And nobody else on this board will. I mean, there, you have a circle of friends. You have a circle of acquaintances. You have a circle of contacts that you meet on a regular basis. And you have an opportunity to witness to them. And testify to them the glorious gospel of the grace of God. That's what Paul said. He, he said, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. And then in the very, the very next verse, in verse 3, Paul says, Thou for, I'm sorry, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, folks, when we got saved and learned the truth, nobody ever said it was going to be easy. And it's not. I mean, if you're like me, I was very religious, and I, I enjoyed the religion part of church. I enjoyed the, the choir, and I enjoyed all the organizational stuff. And it's hard to get away from that. But it came a time when... All of that, I counted as dung for Christ's sake. Uh, there are multitudes of people that are, are not willing to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And yet that's what Paul has told us to do, endure hardness. It is hard. It's not going to be easy. It's hard to be rejected by your friends. It's hard to be rejected by your family. It's hard at work to be thought of as some kind of nut case. Uh, especially you, you work in an office uh, uh, and, and there's people that work around you all day long. I, I see Kim's online here and she's talked to me in the past about uh, working in an office and, and the, the religious comments that people make. And, you know, sometimes you, you, it's hard to sit and listen to that stuff over and over again. And, you know, at times you just shake your head and you, you, you know that if you say anything, people are just going to think you're some kind of nut. And yet, one-on-one, -on -one, there are times when you can take opportunities to insert the truth and to show people the truth of the Word right in their body and the importance of acknowledging dispensational truth. But remember, it's not going to be easy. It never is. It's hard to do what Paul told Timothy to do, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the same chapter, some really good information, some really practical information for perilous times, 
when Paul says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You see what Paul said there? Study. Now, study, the Bible says, is a weirdness to the flesh. It's hard to make time and find time to study. It's easier to turn on the TV and watch a sports program or some other program or Dr. Phil or whatever it might be we watch. I get kidded because I watch Dr. Phil. And, uh, well, we'll just drop that part. But anyway, uh, I watch sports. I, but, but listen, there needs to be a time of Bible study. We make time to do everything else during the day. And you ought to set aside and determine that you're going to spend time in the Word. I get up in the morning, I get a cup of coffee, and before I ever turn the TV on, I get on my computer, I have a Bible program on there, and I I read two or three chapters a day at the minimum. And then if I'm studying a particular subject, like today, I did some study on the gifts of the spirit that we're covering on Sunday. And, uh, but I, there are mornings when that doesn't get accomplished. I'll admit it. But when you miss a morning, if you wake up and you you have things to do, like this morning, for example, I had to go take the car and needed to get there early and get served. I didn't do that. You don't have to be regimented so that you feel like you're a failure if you don't do it, but you ought to try to set aside a time and study the Bible, because no matter how much you listen to me, or Brother Jerry, or Mark, or any other preacher for that matter, it's not going to be enough to establish you so that when you have questions asked, you will know the answers. You ought to be reading regularly through Romans through Philemon. We have a schedule on Facebook that we've used several times, many times, where you can read through Paul's epistles in one month. And what will happen is when you study and you read those verses, even if you just read them, if you don't take time to study them, you will become familiar where those passages are on the pages in your Bible. And not only that, when you hear a doctrine taught contrary to those, uh, you may not be able to give verse, number, and scripture, but you'll know that it's in there. For example, if somebody said, well, uh, what does Paul say about eating of meats? You will immediately know that there was a passage that we covered tonight where Paul said that there are those that teach that you should abstain from meats are teaching doctrines of devils. And you could tell the person, listen, that I, I remember years ago I was sitting in my office at Blue Cross and there was a girl that came rushing in my office and uh, she was a, a good friend of mine. And she said, Brother Steve, or, or not Brother Steve, she said, Steve, she said, have you got your Bible in, in your desk? I said, yes. Yeah. She said, what verse would you use to show a seventh day at Venice that it's all right to eat meat? And so I pulled my Bible out. I turned right over there to the passage where Paul said there are doctrines of devils when they abstain to, uh, from meats, to teach things, people that should abstain from meats. And... Uh, she immediately said, glory, hallelujah. She said, I knew there was something in there about that, just didn't know where it was. Now, I happen to know where it was, but the point is, she knew it was there. She had studied her Bible enough to know it was there, and so she was able to take that verse. She wrote down the reference. She's going to go back and show the lady. You see, there's always opportunities that we have to share the truth with people, and we ought to take them. Study to show thyself what approved unto God, and the next phrase, a workman. You see, that's why we study. We don't study simply to to try to uh, prove ourselves smarter than everybody else. I, I couldn't do that if I tried. But what we study for is because as a workman, we want to be ready and approved. If you're hiring a workman to do a job at your house, you want somebody that you feel confident of uh, that knows what they're doing. If somebody's going to work on your car, you want somebody that has studied working on cars. Well, 
you need to be studied. You need to learn all that you can about the Word of God and start with Paul's epistles. And then as you branch out from there, having learned the doctrine, you can consider what he says and understand all things. So Paul said, study. Uh, he says there in Second Timothy chapter 2, in verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. And so we have the ministry of, of teaching the word of God rightly divided. And we have the ministry of proclaiming the gospel of the grace of God. About to drop my notes there. And uh, just a couple of other things. Notice in chapter 3, in verse 14. In chapter 3, notice what Paul says to Timothy. He says there in chapter 3, verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Learned them. You know, those first three words are words that ought to burn into our heart and mind because there's never time to quit, folks. Continue thou. Continue thou, he says, in the things which thou hast learned and have been assured of, know of whom, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And then in Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul said, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove and rebuke with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what we can do, folks. That's some practical information. That's some practical instructions for perilous times. I don't believe you can find any better instruction anywhere than what we've read here in the Word of God. Paul's instructions to Timothy for perilous times. And notice the result of all of that in Second Timothy chapter 4 in verse... 6, Paul said, I am now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I hope that every one of us will be able to say that when it's our time to depart. Because that's what life is really all about for the saved individual is to hit make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. To glory in the cross of Christ and to proclaim the gospel of Christ so that people can see that Jesus Christ died for their sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. To see that their salvation is totally and completely dependent upon what Christ did and not what we do. You may be listening tonight, and deep down in your heart, you know that you're not even saved. Well, Paul's gospel is the only gospel to save you, and that gospel it's very simple. It's how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And he said the gospel is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So if you've never been saved, tonight trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Just receive the free gift of salvation. And if you are saved, which I hope all everybody listening is, then get on with the business of doing what God would have you to do to make all men see the truth of the fellowship of the mystery and to see the gospel of the grace of God and to see the word of God rightly divided so that they can, they can joy in the truth that you know and have the liberty that you have by recognizing dispensational truth, the word rightly divided, and seeing that our apostle is the apostle Paul and that our doctrine is found in Romans through Philemon. 